What's up YouTube, this is Tank Control Games, Spooky Season's in full swing, and I've been playing a lot of horror games lately, particularly several entries in the Resident Evil series, and that has me hyped for the next installment coming out in just a few short months, Resident Evil Requiem. I've been watching a lot of the gameplay demos, which feature not one but two playable perspectives, and that got me thinking about how much the camera defines the feel of horror. The same level has a completely different vibe between the first and third person modes, and as much as I love those modern perspectives, I can't help but be nostalgic for the one that started it all, the fixed camera. Camera. To me, nothing beat exploring the RPD in Resident Evil 2 for the first time. Every hallway felt dangerous, every shot cinematic, and that loss of camera control really contributed to this sense of powerlessness that's perfect for horror games. So for this series, we're bringing it back to the 90s. We're going to be building an expandable fixed camera system in Unreal 5, complete with multiple camera types and options for both classic and modern controls. In part 1, we'll be starting with the foundation of the system, the camera triggers. I'll be using Unreal 5.6, but if you're following along in another version, just note that some of the settings may have shifted around. So without further delay, let's jump right into it. Let's start by launching the Unreal Project Browser. Click on the Games tab, and then select the third person template, we'll be using this as our base. Name your project however you'd like, I'll be calling mine Resident Evil Cam. Once the project loads, open the content drawer and create a new folder called Blueprints. Inside that folder, right-click again and create a new blueprint actor and rename it to BP underscore camera trigger, then double-click it to open our new blueprint. Under the Components tab, click the green plus button and search for Box Trigger, then click it again and add a cube component. Rename the cube to Line. In the viewport, scale the cube into a thin line shape and position it along the bottom center of the box trigger. With the line selected, open the Details panel and set Collision Preset to No Collision and make sure Can Step Up On is set to No. Then select the box trigger and uncheck Hidden in Game. We can recheck this later, but for now this will help us visualize things better. Now let's add two arrow components. Rename one Enter and one Exit. Give them distinct colors, for example green for Enter and red for Exit, and rotate them so the green arrow points left and the red arrow points right. With the box selected, scroll down to the Details panel until you find On Components Begin Overlap. Click the small plus icon and add it to the event graph. In the event graph, press B to add a branch node. Drag off the other actor and type in equal to create an equal object node. Right click and search for get player character, then connect it to the B input of the equal node, then hook up its output into the condition pin of our branch. Now off the true pin, right click and search for set timer by event. Drag off the return value and choose promote to variable and name it timer handle. Before creating a new timer, we want to check if one already exists, so drag our new variable into the graph and search for is valid timer handle. From that node, drag off and press B again to create another branch. Connect the false path to set timer event node so it only creates a new timer if one doesn't already exist. If it's true, drag off the timer handle again and search for unpause timer by handle. This will resume any existing timer instead of spawning a new one. For visualization, add a print string node and connect it to the set timer by event node. In the string field, type in timer created. In the set timer event settings, set the time to 0.1 and check looping. Finally, drag off the event pin and search for create event then select Create Matching Function and name it Timer. Next, with the box collision selected, go to the Details panel and add an event for On Component End Overlap. We want to perform the same player check we did before, so either copy those nodes over or select them and choose Collapse to Function. Set the function to Pure and name it Is Player Actor. Now create a branch node and hook it up to the event. When true, add a print string node with the message Stop Checking, then drag your timer handle variable back into the graph and search for Pause Timer by Handle. Now let's add a few comments to stay organized. Here's what our setup does so far. On begin overlap, we check if we've overlapped with the player. Then we check if a timer already exists. If it does, we unpause that timer. If not, we create a new timer and print a debug message confirming it was created. On end overlap, we check if the exiting actor is the player, print a debug message, and pause the timer. This timer effectively acts as a custom tick for this actor, one that only runs while we're overlapping the box collision. To see this in action, add one more print string off of timer and in the string write running. Start the level and walk into and out of the overlap volume to see everything working. When we enter the volume, we should see our created timer message appear. While we stay inside, we'll see our running message, and then when we exit the volume, we'll see the stop checking message displayed. Alright, everything seems to be working as intended, so let's jump back into the blueprint and keep building. Now off our timer event, we're going to use a math concept called dot product to try to figure out which side of the line the player is on. 
Right click in the graph and get player pawn or player character, then drag off of it and search for get actor location. Next, add a subtract node. Now drag the line component into the graph and get both its world location and forward vector. Connect the player's location to the A input of the subtraction node and the line's world location into the B input. This gives us a vector pointing from the player to the line. Then normalize that vector, which just means converting it to a unit length of 1. From the normalized output, search for dot product and hook the line's forward vector into the B input of the dot node. To visualize what's happening, drag off the dot product output and connect it to a print string node. Now back in the editor, hit play and walk through the volume. You'll see a float value appear on screen, and as you cross the line, you'll notice the value changes from positive to negative. Based on our arrow setup, you'll see a negative value when entering the volume and a positive when exiting. Back in our blueprint, let's drag off our dot node and search for sign. Using the sign node here turns the constantly changing float we had before into a simple plus one or minus one, which prevents flickering or rapid triggers when the player is right near the center of the line. Add a comment box around the sign node and label it current side. Now add a branch node and connect it to our timer event. Before we switch cameras, we're going to do two checks. So under variables, create a new float called previous side. Drag off current side and add a not equal node and connect the previous side into the B input. Then drag off the return value and add an AND node. We'll feed a second condition into this. For that second condition, drag off the dot product output and add an absolute node. If you temporarily plug this into the print string, you'll see it behave like a distance from line value. You'll get positive values on either side of the line, and if you stand right on top of it, you should get zero. Back in the blueprint, create another float variable called min plane gap and set its default value to 0.2. Drag off the absolute node and add a greater than node. Connect min plane gap to the B input of the greater than, then plug its return value into the second input of the AND node. Now your AND output's true only when the side actually changed, um, current side does not equal previous side, and you're far enough from the line, absolute dot is greater than the min plane gap to avoid the flicker. After our branch, drag the previous side variable into the graph, choose set, and input the result of the sign node. Drag off the sign output again and add a less than or equal to node, leaving the compare value at 0, 0. From the return value, add select string, set A to equal entering, and B equals exiting. Hook this into the print string for debugging and remove the earlier debug print. Jump into the game and test, you should see entering on the green side and exiting on the red. If everything looks good, jump back into the blueprint. Drag the same less than condition out and add a branch node. True is entering and false is exiting. Right click and add a set view target with blend node. If you're not seeing it, uncheck context sensitive if needed. Then right click again and add a get player controller node and plug it into the target. Now we need two camera variables. Under the variables tab, click the plus icon to create a new one. Then click the drop down and search for camera actor. Name this variable enter camera. Then click the eye icon next to it to make it instance editable. Duplicate it and name the duplicated variable exit camera. Wire enter camera to the upper set view target with blend node the true path, and exit to the lower one, the false path. Leave blend settings as default for now. Connect the true path from the branch to the top node and false to the bottom. Okay, now let's organize and comment the graph. Okay, so a quick overview before the final test. First, we take the sign of the dot product to get a clean plus one or minus one value to determine the current side of the line that the player's on. We only proceed when the side changes, aka the current side does not equal the previous side, and when absolute dot is greater than the min plane gap to avoid any flickering if the player is standing right over the line. Then we set previous side to equal the current side, and then check if the current side is greater than zero to decide if we're entering or exiting, then switch to either the enter or exit camera with a blend. Lastly, back in the editor, select your camera trigger actor. In the details panel, you'll now see our enter camera and exit camera variables. Click the quick add button near the top of the editor and search for camera actor. Add two cameras to your scene and position them however you'd like. With your camera trigger selected, open the dropdowns for enter camera and exit camera and assign the cameras you just placed. Alright, let's run the game and test it out. 
and there you go everything's working perfectly the cameras are switching properly and i see all of our debug messages displaying as they should but you'll probably notice right away that the controls feel a little off when the camera switches it's tough to move accurately because the input is still based on player rotation rather than camera rotation so let's fix that we're going to want to open the character blueprint so head to the content drawer and search for third person and then open bp underscore third person character inside find and open the move function this is what handles movement input from your keyboard or gamepad sticks. You'll see we're getting the control rotation and using it to build right and forward vectors for movement. That setup works fine when the player can move and rotate the camera freely, but it breaks when the camera is fixed in place. So instead we want rotation based on the camera's direction. Right click and search Get Player Camera Manager. From that node drag off and search for Get Camera Rotation. Now add a break rotator node and plug Roll and Yaw into the right vector and just Yaw into the forward vector. Compile and return to the editor, and you'll see the movement now matches the active camera and it's much smoother and easier to control when switching angles. It's still not perfect, and you might notice the character sometimes tries to turn back the other way depending on how your camera is angled, but that's something we'll fix in a later part of the series. Now that the foundation of our system is complete, let's see it in action. I set up this basic level using Fab's abandoned cathedral map, which is free for the month of October. I place several camera triggers throughout the scene, scaling them as needed for each area, and this is the final result. So already playing it is giving me that nostalgic Resident Evil vibe. This was super fun to experiment with and see it all come together. In part 2 we'll expand this system even further by adding new camera types like an on-rail and tracking camera to bring even more cinematic variety to your levels. So did you enjoy part 1? If you did, drop a like, and if you have any questions, leave a comment down below or message me on Discord. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in part 2.